director of the Northern Cheyenne Tribal Education Department in Lame Deer, Montana. I've been there 32 years. In fact, that's where I started my journey um, with the constitutional language. And uh, at, that, at that time, we did not have uh, too many high school graduates. My program is a scholarship program. And we didn't have any college graduates when I started at all. And I wondered why. And I thought, well, I've just got to start working with the state and see what's, what's going on with, uh, with our students in the state. And so that began my journey uh, when I became the director and found out our kids were not achieving in our public school systems. We had high dropout rates. Our students were expelled from school. We had high um, special ed program students. It was just really uh, devastating, and I needed to find out why. And uh, so I was so happy when we, uh, the Constitutional, uh, Constitutional Convention put the language into the Constitution pertaining to American Indians, and I'd just like to read that. And it's Article 10, Clause 2. The state recognizes the distinct and unique cultural heritage of American Indian and its commitment, commitment to its educational goals, to the preservation of their cultural integrity. Very strong words, very, very strong words. <clears throat> and so I was really happy and I was very involved in the very beginning when that language became um, known to us that we were in the Constitution, that we were recognized and we could begin the work to begin educating all the children in Montana as well as our educators. And uh, we started out um, working with our teachers who were required to have six credits. And then as you know, it kind of went by the wayside and the teacher unions uh, made it not mandatory that they take the six credits. And so there was a lull there for a while. But I have two dynamic women here, two Native women who are going to, to talk to you today. And, uh, and uh, we're gonna kind of have a discussion uh, and I'm gonna ask them some questions and their thoughts about the constitutional language. And so the first person uh, that I'd like to introduce is Denise Juno, and most of you know Denise Juno. But she spent her adult life ensuring that all citizens have access to a quality education that can open the doors to a better future. Her work in public schools and leading Montana state education agencies has meant increased opportunities for all students and a collective boost to the state's economy. After graduating from Browning High School, Denise received her bachelor's degree in English from Montana State University. She continued her education and earned a master's in education from Harvard Graduate School of Education. After teaching in North Dakota and Montana and working at the State Education Agency, Denise set her sights on the legal profession and received her Juris Doctorate from the University of Montana School of Law. Denise is an enrolled member of the Mandan Hadatsa tribes and a descendant of the Blackfeet tribe. In 2008, she became the first American Indian woman in the country ever elected to an executive statewide office. In 2012, she was re-elected to a second term as Montana's superintendent of public instruction. Thank God for that. As students, uh, superintendent, <laughs> And she'll tell you about that as well. As Superintendent Denise launched an unprecedented effort to make sure all Montana students who graduate from high school are prepared for their next steps, she developed a statewide initiative, Graduation Matters Montana, which has made a positive difference in more than 50 communities. Under her tenure, Montana graduation rate increased to its highest level ever recorded. Prior to serving as state superintendent, Denise was the director of Indian education for the Montana State Education Agency. She led the implementation of Indian education for all, 
which call for every student to have access to accurate history about American Indians and to learn about their contemporary lives. Under her leadership, tribal nations defined seven essential understandings regarding Montana Indians. She also worked with educators and organizations to make available hundreds of lesson plans spanning nearly every academic contact area and provided high quality professional development to teachers, administrators across the state. Her career includes many historic firsts. She is the first Native woman elected to a statewide executive office, the first Native superintendent in Seattle, and the first out LGBTQIA federal candidate in Montana. And I wish she would have won that race. <laughs> the other young lady is Lillian Alvernaz. And she is Dakota and Nakota. She recently was transferred from Chief Prosecutor, Presenting Officer to Parents Defender for the Fort Belknap Indian Community. Ms. Alvernaz previously served as the first ever Indigenous Justice Legal Fellow for ACLU of Montana. Ms. Alvernaz graduated with honors in 2013 from the University of Montana and received a Bachelor of Arts in Social Work and Native American Studies. In 2018, Ms. Alvernaz obtained a Juris Doctorate in Law Certificate and Masters of Public Administration. Ms. Alvernaz hopes to help find and fill the gaps left by the marriage of law and policy in Indian Country. Ms. Alvernaz is barred in the state of Montana Federal District Court of Montana and Fort Belknap Tribal Court. Ms. Alvernell serves as Chair of Indian Law Section and Public Policy Institute of the Rockies. She serves as a board member of the Montana Budget and Policy Center and their State Tribal Advisory Council. The University of Montana Alumni Association and the Montana Indigenous Food Sovereignty Initiative. So we'll uh, just begin our discussion, and I'm going to ask them some questions. And um, so to both of you, uh, Denise, um, do you want to go first? Or, but it would be both of you, <laughs> either Lillian and, and, uh, and Denise. Uh, when you think of the Montana Constitution, what do you think about? What is your view about the delegate's ability to include Native people and perspectives into our state foundational document? Well, hello, good, mo good morning, good afternoon, good lunch time, yeah. It's great to see um, all of you here and uh, it's really great to be back in the 406. I'm really happy to be back in Montana and be able to participate in things like this that are so important to everybody across the state um, and the things that we talk about. It looked like an impressive lineup here dur during um, this whole convention sort of thing and just want to really thank the original delegates who are still around to for the words that the, and the coming together that they did for Montana. And as all of you know, there was not one Native delegate amongst those first 100 delegates that came together to create this Constitution. And so the ability for Native advocates to come into this place, advocate for what they wanted to see about themselves in the Constitution, in our schools, across the state, is super powerful. And I think that is the biggest lesson that we can still have today, is it's going to take a lot of advocacy to continue to work towards um, Native power in this state and across the country. But that we have young people who are going to lead that, just like they did during the Constitutional Convention. One thing I will say is, as we get into this conversation and talk a little bit more about it, you know, one of the goals is for Indian education for all, you know, the for all really is sort of two-pronged. It's definitely for natives, but it's also for white people, probably more so for white people, to learn about native people in this state and to see us 
um, in all the spaces, not just at a lunchtime conversation panel about Indian education for all, that we do have voices that can be raised in all of these areas. We have things to say about water rights. We have things to say about privacy. We have things to say about all of the issues that you're gonna hear about today. Um, and so eventually, as we can continue on with um, all these conversations about finding Native people in all the spaces, maybe you'll see us on those panels as well. But I, am, uh, I think this is a really important conversation for us to have to remember um, the work that it took to get Native people placed into the Constitution to get those words there and the subsequent actions that it had to take. It took advocacy, um, it took uh, coming to the legislature, it took electing Native people to the legislature so they could advocate like Norma Bixby, being in those spaces and raising their voices to the halls of power. It took lawsuits, it took litigation, it took attorneys. It was not an easy path to make sure this happened. But for the original document to actually have those words um, and have Native people represented in the Constitution, I think is super powerful. It says a lot about Montana. It's the only state with those words in its state constitution, and it's led to a lot of great things. And so when I think of the state constitution, I do think it's a progressive document. I think it has a lot of great, um, protections in there for citizens. It allows sunshine to come in for a government and for all, all of us to know, for the most part, how our government's working and where people are at a certain given times. Um, and just allows us to track what our government um, is up to. But also, um, you know, I built my career in education and so the Indian Education for All clause is super important to me. And, um, and what it turned out to be is, is really heartening. There's certainly a lot more work that needs to be done, um, but that's what I think of when I think of the state constitution. Hello, as Norma said, my name is Lillian Alvarez. When I think of the state constitution, I think something that's really, really important and foundational to understand and remember is that tribes are separate sovereigns from the state of Montana. So the inclusion of Native people within the constitution really was on an individual basis of individual Native people like Denise talked about. Tribes have their, just like the federal government and like state governments, tribes have their own uh, constitutions, their bylaws, their own set of governing documents and laws that govern within Indian country that is separate from the Montana state constitution and, and federal government. They intersect at times, but that's not always the case. By and large, in general, states do not have any authority or jurisdiction within tribal land, within Indian country. And that's important to remember because Indian people, whether they live on the reservation or off the reservation, have to navigate relationships with state governments, with local, county, cities, and federal governments. These relationships and issues are complex and they're always improving. And what I'll talk more about this afternoon later will be the increased visibility of Indian people and making those relationships smoother and better. Like Denise stated about Indian Ed for All, there is room for improvement, but it is a foundational part of our Constitution. And my experience and understanding of this clause of the Constitution comes mostly from my time at the ACLU of Montana, which as you all know, they are engaged in an active uh, lawsuit regarding Indian Ed for All. What I think the most important thing, just to highlight and underline what Denise said, is that Native students outside of the delegation asked for what the Bill of Rights and Education Committees would do to ensure the education opportunity, quote, to study our own culture, perhaps our own language, and to develop a real feeling of pride in themselves for their own heritage and culture. And I think that's very important to continue to think about when we think about Indian Ed for All. Thank you, very good thoughts. <clears throat> This hasn't been an easy journey for us. Uh, even though the language is there, we were basically ignored. Uh, and that was part of my journey as well, is trying to bring about awareness. And we tried this in various methods. We tried to, um, we de developed an Indian culture master plan, which uh, the Indian tribes use as a way to train teachers. 
We developed a, a plan for American Indian education in Montana, which we included uh, the governor's office, the legislatures, the school boards, uh, the State Board of Public Ed, and the Board of Regions, and we had them set goals and try to set direction for the implementation of this, uh, this new language and in an education for all. And it was all to avail. We just couldn't make them realize how important this was to our Indian children and their success in their education, improving their education and um, becoming a citizen of Montana as well as their reservations and uh, to improve their lives. And this is, education was one way to do it. But trying to convince people to, um, to appreciate the language and to implement something that would uh, improve and educate all of Montana uh, about the American Indians in our state. So the next question uh, for uh, did, uh, to Lillian is talk to us a little bit about tribal law difference from state. Pardon? Go ahead. Go ahead. That one. Okay. <laughs> and federal law and how if the state's constitution plays a part in your work. Thank you. So during my time at the Fort Belknap Indian community, I really didn't ever see the Montana State Constitution. My work was primarily with the, uh, the tribal code of Fort Belknap and also a lot to do with the federal, the federal government, their, the constitution and all of the federal laws and regulations that apply to tribes and restrict us and kind of guide us on what we can sentence individuals and what we can even um, charge as crimes. So by and large, my, my experience, I haven't had any experience while I was at the Fort Belknap Indian community because of that separate sovereignty of the tribe having our own constitution, bylaws, and set of governing documents. And because they are separate, they do not apply to each other and do not really impact each other. Thank you, Lillian. Denise, you watched the Indian Education for All provision of Montana Constitution come about from its inclusion in the state constitution to the 1999 legislative intent to the lawsuit and subsequent legislative funding. You also helped to implement IFA in schools across the state from the state superintendent's seat. Tell us about that journey and what it meant to you and to the students. I'm going to speak a little bit, then I'm actually going to throw it back to Norma because she was here, like in this capital, helping to pass that law. Um, and it's always an interesting perspective to hear from legislators who had to sort of um, lead in those spaces where it wasn't always popular um, and then succeed. And so I think it's important, you know, that Norma is one of the grandmothers of Indian education for all in this state and to hear her voice um, as well in this, in this space about what, how that clause came to be, I think is super important or how the law came to be. So <clears throat> all of you know that there is that clause in the state constitution um, I talked a little bit about how it took so much advocacy to make sure that we solidified it in state statute. Um, I can remember times when Norma and my mom, Carol Juno, were sort of trying to navigate, uh, even just trying to get the, st the constitutional intent um, solidified in the statute. It was quite the journey. Diane Sands was there and gets, I mean, just, it was, it was an uphill battle just to say, here's what that constitutional language means to the state. Um, and that's, I think, what you can talk about in a little bit about how that got done, actually, for real, on the ground. Um, and, and once that became solidified, but I remember there were kids like who came from St. Labray, you know, elementary students who came, who had collected, I think, $285 from their community and marched down to the governor's office and said, here's the first funding for Indian education for all since the state won't do anything. 
The Montana Indian Education Association brought students in and they stood outside here and there was a table and they could come get your pay the payment is due sort of bills and they all came and they signed them and they marched them down to the governor's office and said it's time for you to fund Indian education for all. And so it's always, you know, Lillian talked about the young people who came to the Constitutional Convention and spoke truth to power in that Bill of Rights Committee to get Indian people reflected in the state constitution. It has always been young people who have come to the aid of trying to make sure that they see themselves present, um, not only here and not only in the state capitol, but in their schools. That's really what Indian Education for All is about, is like, where are Native people reflected? Are they in the hallways? Do you see them in the posters and classrooms? Are they in the books that they're reading? In an accurate fashion, accurate and truthful, I think is the name of the game as we're talking about this. Um, Norma, re Norma reflected a little bit about even before um, the state, the state statute came about, there was a lot of effort. There was, there was a Montana Advisory Council on Indian Education at the state level who always sat in spaces and tried to create paths for non-Indians to learn about American Indians, bringing tribes to the table about what should, um, what should non-Indians in this state know about American Indians and putting together, like she said, essential understandings. Um, and then basing everything that we did off those essential understandings and having tribes and native people define what is it that people should learn and then building things off of that is just super important. Um, but the navigation of trying to get that done in this state has not been easy. There was a lawsuit that happened that Montana Indian Education Association came along the side with a amicus brief that sort of like laid out what was happening. Um, it was a quality uh, funding lawsuit. Um, and this court came back, the Supreme Court, basically it was the strongest piece of the lawsuit. And the state Supreme Court came back to the legislature and said, legislature, you have not defined what a quality education is. Get back in to session, figure out what quality education means to this state. And Indian Education for All became a part of what that is. So there's a huge list of this is what the quality education means to the state of Montana. And Indian Education for All is in that provision because that brief was actually the strongest piece. The Supreme Court came back and said, state, you have done nothing to implement this provision. You have done nothing. And so you need to find a way out to figure it. And so because it became a part of that list of what a quality education is, they then had to fund it. And that's really where things can't, you know, took off. And so, you know, we can talk about all the nice things that we want to happen um, in any sector in this state. Um, we're looking at a lot of big challenges in this state. And until money follows it, until taxpayer funds actually get appropriated to implement something that is meaningful and valuable to the state of Montana, like Indian Education for All, it is super hard. Um, OPI has had an Indian education specialist forever. Um, I was that person, that person, for a long time until the state funded it. And then there was a division of people actually working on this. And it got integrated into the state education agency across all sectors and then got out to schools. And I think the most powerful thing for me is not only watching young people sort of shepherd these processes and really shaming people and the adults in power into doing something um, that it, once we got Indian Education for All going, I mean, teachers, white teachers who make up probably 98% of the state's population of teachers never realized what they had not learned and never realized they went through their K-12 system learning nothing about Indians and went through college and their teacher ed programs learning nothing about Indians. And now that we were in a space in the state where they were teaching and were saying, teach about Indians. And so they didn't know how to take those first steps. So we had to create a lot of material, a lot of lesson plans, a lot of resource guides. Um, and then when they took those, they were like, well, we don't have the background knowledge to do it. So then we had to pivot and provide a lot of professional development and have them unlearn what they had learned and then relearn. Um, 
an accurate and truthful and honest history of this state and this country. Um, and so that took a lot. It was a huge, huge lift. Um, I wish, you know, higher ed sort of excused itself for a while. I think it's probably still excused itself and they need to get on board with how this is rolling out. Um, because I used to say, until teacher ed programs produce people who are competent in Indian education for all, we will always be in the remediation stage for that as they step out of their teacher ed programs. Um, but one of the most powerful things I think, a few of the most powerful things I saw is when Native students start seeing themselves reflected in non-reservation schools and the power that came and the engagement that they were suddenly reflected in the books they were reading and the people who were coming to visit their classroom um, was super meaningful. And teachers talked about how those students, those young people, all of a sudden got engaged and felt like they had a little more sense of belonging in those spaces. And then the other thing is, as we were having a lot of conferences and summits and things like that, um, the first few years were, of course, led by tribal people and native people. But it became super powerful when our keynotes all of a sudden were non-Indian teachers. And they were leading other non-Indian teachers about how important it was to learn native content and learn about the native people who inhabit um, Montana and always have and I think that was really a big shift for the state when those types of activities started happening when teachers could recognize the power of bringing native people into the classroom or reading native books with um, positive native characters the shift in young people and how um, they felt engaged in their classroom and the shift for teachers when it was non-Indian teachers standing in front of them teaching them about the importance of that. Those were the two biggest shifts. I've been out for a while, so I'm not sure where that currently is. Um, but that's sort of, as I was leaving office, um, the big things that I saw. It was super important. Things were happening. Things were clicking. There were hundreds of lesson plans that teachers could access across all curricular areas, um, professional development was happening in a very real way. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, but I, I do think looking back, I mean, had that language not been in the state constitution, we wouldn't be standing here talking about it. And so we do owe a lot to those delegates who got up on the floor, those non-Indian delegates, and advocated um, that this, these words be included in the state constitution. We also owe a lot to uh, the grandmothers of Indian Education for All as they gained political power and stepped into the halls of the legislature and were able to get up on the floor and speak to their colleagues about the importance of um, putting these languages into statutory um, languages and having it reflected in our state laws, um, the importance of Indian Education for All. Um, and Norma Bixby is one of those women and so, Norma, I'd just like you to speak a little bit about your role in getting that done and sort of a little, maybe, a reflection of the importance of that and what it meant for you to kind of help shepherd that language through. Well. I can remember clearly those days because uh, when Carol Juno introduced that bill, uh, I was up in the audience, uh, I was in the Senate side, it was on the floor, and uh, it was 1999. In fact, uh, it was my birthday, April 29th. <laughs> but I had my uh, one of my children with me, and um, as the Senate was debating uh, the bill, I was holding up my child, letting him see that this was the purpose for that bill, House Bill 528, to be passed and become law. And uh, my own representative from our area was not going to vote for that bill. But I put my grandchild out there right where he could see him. <laughs> And he did vote yes on it, but the bill died on a tie vote. 
House Bill 528 died on a tie vote. And that was devastating. And so I ran down the stairs, and uh, Carol was coming out, or was out in the hallway, and Spook Stain came out, and I said, Spook, what are we gonna do? What are we gonna do? How can we get this bill passed? And he says, Norma, don't worry about it. We'll get this bill passed. And sure enough, he did. We got the bill passed, House Bill 528, and that sent us on another journey to begin to uh, implement House Bill 528 in the uh, Office of Public Instruction, uh, the Board of Public Ed. We went to meetings and tried to encourage them to um, uh, implement uh, the language. And uh, I can always remember Mike Jetty, uh, was it 20-1-501 um, was, <laughs> Mike Jetty made a song out of that. And you heard Mike Ye Jetty yesterday. He made a song out of, house, uh, of that 20-1-501. It was just, it was music to our ears because that became uh, the rules for Indian education for all. And so in 2000, I was elected to the legislature and uh, which began another journey and of course, uh, Internet for All was, uh, was something that I really wanted to work on and, and get some money for our children. Because when I went to um, committee meetings to, uh, to sit on uh, the standards development, teachers said, no, we, don't, we can't do that. We can't teach another thing. We already teach a lot of things and we can't teach another thing. We don't have any materials, we don't have any books. And I could understand that. And schools didn't have any money. And so Carol and I uh, went up and uh, we talked to Governor Schweitzer. And we told him that we really needed some money. And so he did, Governor Schweitzer did put money into a bill for us to, uh, to fund the school systems. It wasn't very much, but it was enough to get us started for Internet for All, and also for closing the achievement gap. There was money put in for that, and there still is money. But you know, it's a drop in a bucket. And we need to continue to educate our legislators about the importance of this constitutional language that is going to change the lives of these young people. They are going to be the leaders. They're going to be the ones up here. And what better way to do that than to make them feel a part of this great state of Montana through uh, that constitutional language. And that's one way to do it is to make sure they have the funds, the schools have the funds, the Office of Public Instruction has the funds to continue developing the materials, uh, the resources. There is no excuse anymore for teachers not to have lesson plans. There is even a lesson plan about the Constitution that I just recently read, and it is wonderful. And May asked me, she said, do you think the schools implement that? And I said, I don't know, but I don't think they do. I don't think they really teach about the Constitution and what it meant for American Indians. And uh, I'm hoping they will. It's there for them to take advantage of and so that all children can learn about our Constitution, not only the portion about American Indians, but all the other wonderful parts that we heard today. And the only way we can do that is through education. And so it's, um, it was a challenge for Carol and I. We tried to get more money into the budget. I remember I sit up about maybe four or five times on House Bill 2, trying to put more money in there, and it was denied every single time. So we never did raise the money. And so we do have a little bit of money. I think it's about $29 uh, per student, I think, about that area. It's still been that for years and years. I think it's about time the legislature uh, take another look at that and put more money into um, Internet for All. Oh. <laughs> Well, this is a question for uh, both of you, Lily and Denise. What is your view of native political power in Montana? Does the state constitution play a role in that power?
Thank you. When, when, going back to the comments you both just made, one important thing to, well, to think about is what I believe is I, Indian Ed for All and the Achievement Gap funding are, to me, one and the same. It's my belief and understanding, and there's studies and there's research beh backed behind when Native people, like Denise was talking about, are reflected in our teachers and in our literature, and it doesn't have to be on an Indian topic, right? Because Indian Ed for All applies to everything and we should be integrated with within every subject. It doesn't have to be the one time you bring the um, the drum group in for Native American Heritage Day. It's, it's throughout. My understanding, based off of that research, is that specifically Native students, the achievement gap, gap will shorten, will lessen, will um, be smaller if Native students can see ourselves in our teachers and in our literature, giving us a real sense of, of pride and having a really positive impact on, on us uh, going throughout education. And I think of, I saw this question and it really made me think of, when's the first time you had a Native teacher? And for me, it wasn't until I got to college, right? So I went K through 12 and I grew up in a border town right next to the reservation and didn't didn't have one native teacher um, until I got to college and then thankfully we did have one native teacher a, in law school as well. And I'm, and I'm not sure if I would have had a native teacher if I didn't study Native American studies in college. So going back to the question, the native political power in Montana is unique, right? So as I stated before, tribes Tribes can influence uh, the politics of Montana, but they are they are separate. So Native people specifically can uh, be elected to the legislature, like Norma, and influence state law. Tribes can influence state law through our candidates and our legislators. We can serve in state government and influence that to benefit Indian people, but it's not really based on behalf of tribes. Sure, our constituents might be on the reservation and really kind of in theory on behalf of tribes, but actually going to the legislature and advocating is really on an on that native individual basis this is especially important because a lot of native americans don't live on the reservation right a lot of us live off of the reservation so it's even more important to have that representation within within the, the legislature I would just say, you know, I've been, I've like watched my mom sort of like, she retired from education and then she became a state legislator. And that to me personally, like watching her be here in these halls to um, be able to navigate this space, to be able to be successful in some of her bills that were super important. Um, and I was working at OPI then, not the superintendent, but I was just working there and when she was first serving. And to watch her rise up on the floor, to watch Norma, you know, all these people, the Native people who were in these halls rise up and give voice to people that they represented um, back home was just super empowering. And I think, you know, that's part of Indian Ed for All is seeing yourselves reflected in all the spaces. And watching my mom, watching Norma, watching other Native women navigate this space, super empowering. Watching them um, speak truth to power and to give hell to the governor and do all the things that legislators do, um, you know, inspired me. And that's, you know, one of the reasons watching them gain power in these spaces encouraged me to run for office myself. The first time I ever ran for office was for state superintendent. And there were a lot of naysayers saying, why don't you run for school board first? I'm like, I don't want to be on a school board. It's like, why don't you run for state legislator? It's like, I don't want to be a legislator. This is the job I want. And, um, and then to have strong Native women who had been elected themselves behind me in that space super important, super powerful, and super empowering. Um, and, you know, buoyed me up in times when I really needed it, knowing that there had been trailblazers of political power that came before me. 
um, and being able to learn from their mistakes and learn from their successes and what it took. And so I am just thankful for the people that came before me um, in running for political office. And then just watching what happens when I was elected and what happened in Indian country and the way that the native votes sort of start, you know, be, being around and being talked about was also super important. But going as the state superintendent to schools on reservations and even schools off reservations that had native kids in it um, was something. And it was always inspiring and I was always honored to be in those spaces, but that they could finally see themselves reflected in places of power, that to me is the importance of running for office, of serving, of being in all these spaces. And so I always like thank people for raising their hand and putting their name on the ballot no matter who they are, because it's not easy. It's not easy to put yourself out there. It's not easy to campaign. It's not easy to be in places where people support you and places where people don't support you. Um, but to see natives in this space and see the number of native legislators that are now present and raising their hand and running for office and not just tribal council, but state legislature and statewide office is just super significant for Montana. And Montana's always been a leader in that space of native elected people and um, advocating for native issues. And, and like Lillian said, all the spaces. We have things to say about all the issues. Um, and we bring a unique perspective um, to these halls as, pe as things are debated. And for me, Indian Education for All also belongs here in the state legislature. And when Indian people are present, there's a lot of learning that happens about tribal sovereignty and constitutional power and um, you know, other issues, challenges that tribes face. And that can only happen when natives are present and people have to stand up and look at them and get to know them and then decide whether to take a vote against them. That's hard. And I think that is just for me to be present in all the spaces and to watch the rise of Native people, particularly in Montana, is um, super significant. And it's, it's going to keep happening. I kind of see a lot of movement to young people really wanting to be engaged. Um, so yeah, it's been super important. So people before me, I was there, people come after me, and it just keeps making Montana a better place as a result of it. Well, you kind of talked about the, um, the political power, but to both of you, what is your view of Native political power in Montana? Does the state constitution play a role in that power? Yes, I asked you that question. <laughs> Do you have anything to add to that, the political power, and the state role of the constitution? Sure. Okay. Thank you. I'll just I'll just jump to my my last my last points, kind of where Denise let off, uh, left off, is that I, I also believe the future of Native people and tribes is on the rise in Montana in state politics, in state politics, and in especially. Um, I know it's not really relevant to this conversation, but just in general, especially in the federal government, where at the last um, election we had the first two Native women in Congress, which is phenomenal, but also wild and blows my mind that there has never been someone like me or like these women in Congress before, before that. Uh, so it's really exciting. There's a lot of room to grow, especially making those monumental changes. As Denise said, there's a record number of Native people in the state legislature, a continued positive relationship with the executive branch built on a foundation of respect, and increased visibility in the awareness and education of the state at large can all have a positive impact and continue to keep Native issues and Native people visible and on the rise um, within the state. So I'll just close and say that this is a really exciting time for Native people. Um, all over the state and all over the nation. There have been some recent Supreme Court uh, 
jurisprudence coming out of the, the United States Supreme Court that's really positive to tribes and it's really exciting and an interesting time for us. Um, I, am, I am excited to continue to see more representation and education of, in all branches of the government in Montana and beyond. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Well, it is 1245, and I know we're, um, May is really tough on getting, making sure things are on time. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Uh, we enjoyed being here. Two dynamic native here. This is our future. These young ladies are our future. And like they say, you know, times are changing, and I think we're going to have more young men and young women in these halls. And one of these days, it might be 50 50. Who knows? <laughs> so thank you so much for being here and, uh, and for your time. Thank you.